and we are live on Facebook. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another New Jersey Constitutional Republicans virtual conversation. It's my great privilege and honor once again to have our dear state senator from LD1, Michael Testa, here today. Thank you, Michael, for joining us. Pleasure to be here, JR. You know, I mean, everybody knows that you and I are, are personal friends, so I appreciate you always hosting this forum and always sticking to your principles. It's, it's refreshing. So thank you for hosting. Well, it's great to have you once again, uh, Michael. And to start with, tell us, it seems like yesterday that you were elected initially as our state senator in LD1, and then right around the corner comes another election. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's, you know, to you, maybe it seems like yesterday, it's been, it, it seems like a long, a long haul for me, I have to tell you. Um, but, you know, we hear 2019, they said it couldn't be done. And myself, Antoine McClellan and Eric Simonson proved all the naysayers wrong. And even a lot of the people that looked at a lot of the people that supported us, you know, it was, I, I wouldn't call it uh you know, light support, but it wasn't full support. You know, it was, it was medium support, I would say, because, you know, most people just thought, Hey, look, you know, there's no way you're going to have a full sweep of the legislative district. And we did it. And we did it because we were a team. And, I, and I've said it many times before, we were sort of like the 1985 Villanova Wildcats basketball team that just gelled at the right time and had a phenomenal tournament run. And, here we are. We shocked the world. And it was the first time a legislative district had been fully flipped to a Republican district in 28 years. And mm. it was the only Republican Senate seat won in the entire United States of America in 2019. And there were state Senate races, only one in the state of New Jersey, Virginia, Kentucky, Mississippi and Louisiana. And you would think that those other states I mentioned are more red than New Jersey. But that wasn't the case in 2019. Uh, there was only one full legislative district flipped in the entire United States, and that was us. That's the Republican Party. That's right. And we dubbed it the Republican resurgence. Of course, now it's important to keep that momentum going uh, with uh, you know, your victory and as well as Team Testa. We just had a great conversation with Assemblyman McClellan. And uh, what a great team. And I was, uh, we were discussing. Um, how the relationship between you and the assemblyman, how close it is and how you discuss these, um, discuss policies, discuss proposed legislation. And it's really been a great um, uh, team that you've built together, uh, known as Team Tasta. Look, I mean, there's, you know, there's no way that anybody that gets into either one of the three seats that we sit in gets there without being a team. We just are the ones that probably announce it the most. I mean, you know, and, and going back to your first question, JR, you know, that you said it seems like such a short time ago. Think about it. We were elected in November of 19. I was sworn in in December because it was a special election. Antoine and Eric mm -hmm. are sworn in in January. And a couple months later, two and a half months later, we have a global pandemic. Um, so yeah, we were certainly the only legislative team in the United States of America that was that were all freshmen dealing with this. And that meant dealing it with through our legislative offices. You know, when we say team, we have a phenomenal team at our legislative offices who were dealing with issues of unemployment, who were dealing with issues with the Motor Vehicle Commission. You know, thousands upon thousands of our constituents were calling our offices. So I have to give kudos to the entire team, not just myself, Eric and Antoine, but the entire team that not only helped us get elected, but then many of which transferred to the governmental side and, and helped us out tremendously. That's right, Michael. And of course, it does seem like a short time to you. Of course, it's been uh, a little longer, but what's remarkable is what you've accomplished in this relatively short amount of time. You've been everywhere, and I would say um, that not only in New Jersey, but any state senator um, to have had the impact and the, the accomplishments and what you've been involved with is unprecedented and unparalleled uh, throughout the country. And I'm not just not saying that because uh, you're a friend and a brother, but 
it's indicative and i'm going to show the people why this is so you've um accomplished so much in so little of time and we don't have enough time today to talk about what you've done but i want to highlight some of the um some of the accomplishments and one of them right off the bat i mean what state senator michael um argued justly before the state supreme court on murphy's unconstitutional borrowing plan and of course anyone who watched it um, would have seen um, how important your fine attorney skills were implemented and utilized in that um in that case before the court so talk to me a little bit about um that experience and uh and what you've learned from it uh, after uh, thinking about it for months afterward? You know, I haven't thought about it in a while, uh, other than the fact that we know now that the state of New Jersey didn't need to borrow any money. I um, mean, that, and that's what right. our, our argument was from the very beginning, that the state of New Jersey should pump the brakes, actually follow the Constitution that we needed a balanced budget. Um, unfortunately, the Supreme mm -hmm. Court disagreed with me, and they, and they really relied on the emergency clause contained in the New Jersey Constitution that gives the governor very broad emergency powers. And if we all remember, though, the governor wanted to borrow $9.8, $9.9 billion. And because of that lawsuit, the state, you know, only, I mean, borrowed $4.6 billion, which we said from the very beginning, they didn't need to do that either. And we were proven correct. Um, the, the problem with that is, as you know, Jr. The type of borrowing that was done were what are called non-callable bonds. And mm -hmm. after it was proven that the state, meaning Governor Murphy and his treasurer, had grossly underestimated the revenues for the state of New Jersey and certified to it, by the way, they had to certify that to the Supreme Court. It turns out that my argument before the Supreme Court and our team's argument before the Supreme Court was, in fact, correct. But due to the nature of the bonds being non-callable, there was no recourse. And, you know, what's sad about that is I got a call from, you know, one of the North Jersey papers that typically leans pretty hard left, in my opinion. And they asked me, well, what can you do about it? I said, the only thing I can do about it now is say I told you so. Because unfortunately, this $4.6 billion of non-callable bonds, there's, mm -hmm. there's nothing we can do to repay it back early, even though now we're allegedly flush with cash. As, the, as Governor Murphy says, now we have a surplus of approximately $10 billion, which I don't understand how you can even call it a surplus when your liabilities far outnumber your revenues. So... Maybe, you know, maybe I maybe I need to take an additional accounting class uh, because certainly it's not the, it's not what I learned in accounting that the Murphy administration employs. Um, and, and to put this into perspective, Jr., you know the the state that had the second highest borrowing in the nation was Illinois, and they only borrowed about one billion dollars. So think about this: what Governor Murphy's original plan was. Talk about overly ambitious and not fiscally responsible. He wanted to borrow, you know, let's call it what it is. We'll round up $10 billion. So they wanted to borrow 10 times what the second worst state in the United States of America was going to borrow. I mean, it just, it, it shows you just a total lack of fiscal responsibility, a total lack of proper government. government. Um, you know, you and I have talked many times. Think about this. Our budget has grown over $10 billion. This is a problem. I mean, this is unsustainable. And unlike the United States Constitution, the New Jersey Constitution provides for a balanced budget. How can we continue yes. to have a quote unquote balanced budget when, in fact, we're, you know, we're our budget is continuing to grow like the blob? You know, it, it, it eats more and gets larger and larger. You know, there, there was a time for belt tightening. And I think that COVID-19 was a time that we should have really been looking at being fiscally responsible and tightening the belt, not going further into the tank. Right. And of course, Michael, the uh, budget has increased by 30% since Phil Murphy uh, has taken over um, the gubernatorial responsibilities in the state.
But I wanted to ask you, and, and I was listening live during that day. I thought it was fascinating, a great education for people. And uh, I actually looked for it uh, online, Michael, and I couldn't find a uh, recording of it. But I thought uh, it would be very beneficial for our citizens to watch that and learn um, what it's like to argue a case before the Supreme Court is extraordinary. But uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you, Michael, is, is that the emergency was exploited to the uh, degree that all of this, we were going in debt to begin with. I mean, we were, uh, we were locking down businesses, we were uh, eliminating tax rateables, and uh, really what should have been argued or what the court should have taken into gr greater consideration is the fact that the reason that Murphy was asking to borrow the money was because of the expansive directive executive orders that he gave out to begin with in, in, in shutting down New Jersey economy, right? You, you, you asked two pretty large questions there. First and foremost, it was an honor to be before the Supreme Court. But usually, you know, for the people that are watching and listening, you know, usually it takes probably about three years in order for a case to get before the state Supreme Court, meaning that it has to go through the trial level. There's an appeal to the appellate division. And then there's an appeal, what's called a, you know, a writ of certiorari um, mm -hmm. to get to the Supreme Court. So you have to petition for cert for certification for, you know, to take it out of the Latin, the Latin lingo. So you have to petition for certification before the state Supreme Court. That took 17 days. Mm -hmm. So by the time we, from the filing of that case, 17 days later, we were before the state Supreme Court. And of course, we were in the early stage, the earlier stages of COVID-19. Everything was done via Zoom, which wasn't anywhere near as, you know, the pageantry of going before the state Supreme Court and being before mm -hmm. the justices. I would have much preferred that, to be quite frank with you and everyone that's listening. But it, it was an honor and it was a fight. And um, it was a fight that I was glad to be a part of the team and an integral part of the team that brought that fight. And it turns out we were correct. You don't hear the press covering that, though, because, you know, the Murphy administration and the treasurer specifically had painted such a bleak financial future and had grossly underestimated revenues for the state of New Jersey. And we should have pumped the brakes. You know, if they wanted to borrow, they should have waited. And then at least then you could see whether they're prognostications were in fact true. And it turns out they weren't. And instead we're strapping our citizenry with bonds for 30 years now that we're going to be paying heavy interest on, you know, lo and behold to many of maybe Governor Murphy's old friends uh, who are who are holding the notes, you know? So that's a real problem. And, and look, mm -hmm. you and I have talked about this before. This is getting to the second portion of your question that Governor Murphy's executive powers were abused. The sad part is, is that they were given the stamp of approval by the legislature. Myself and Senator Doherty introduced legislation to give the legislature a 14-day review of every executive order. And mind you, that would not prevent the governor from issuing further executive orders, but it would have given the legislature a seat at the table and a review period of giving a yay or nay to the current executive orders. And think about this, the democratic controlled legislature voted to take powers away from themselves. And, and again, I always give credit to where credit is due. Senators Oroho and Senator Panaccio also introduced what would have been a constitutional amendment of you know, to allow that 14 day review period. I think that was their legislation, but mine was a piece of legislation uh, along with Senator Doherty and Senators Panaccio and Oroho, it was a constitutional amendment. And in the assembly, it was introduced by Assemblyman Brian Bergen. Like, again, I'm, I'm a team player. I always give credit to where credit's due. And we were all trying to fight the good fight. And unfortunately, you know, with the way the majority is in the Senate and even more of a majority in the assembly, our bills went nowhere. And that's very sad. It is. Uh, before we move on, uh, Michael, to another topic, I just want to, uh, the people to know that you said that um, uh, the framers did not intend to give the state a blank check whenever an unspecified emergency arises, unquote. 
That's quoting you. And I think the key word there was unspecified. And I think if we've learned anything from this whole pandemic shutdown is that we need to specify what constitutes war and what doesn't. And you've heard me talk about this before. Of course, FDR really started this whole expansion of executive powers by declaring war, quote unquote, on the Great Depression. And now we have wars on terror. We have war on drugs. We have um, all these other uh, misapplications of the word war. And Phil Murphy has used the word war on COVID. And this is what has given him the ability to expand these powers. Don't you think, as a legislator, that the legislative body, body needs to clearly define what constitutes an emergency? Because to me, there was disagreement um, amongst you and the justices. The justices were pretty unified in their interpretation of this being an emergency. However, it was not nearly as and even though we lost 20, 27,000 people approximately, it did not reach the limits that, or did not reach the heights of the fatalities that were estimated that would occur. And this is why we were sending people who had COVID into convalescent centers, which is another injustice. Which, by the way, I don't mean to interrupt you, JR. I don't mean to interrupt you, but you know, no, one, just... one third of those numbers, can, you know, the deaths came with people in our long-term care facilities, veterans' homes, and nursing homes. So one-third, mm -hmm. you know, which w w could have been easily preventable if we had just followed mm -hmm. simple germ theory and not placed right. sick individuals in with healthy individuals. You know, look, COVID-19 is very real, right? I mean, you know, so people who are denying it, I, I disagree with, it's real. Uh, many people have had it. We all know someone who has either passed away or had a very severe case I, I unfortunately have known a, a few people who have passed away from COVID-19. It's terrible. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a real disease. However, we don't need to look very far to determine that other states who didn't take as drastic measures as the state of New Jersey didn't manage to shut down approximately one third of all of their small businesses forever. I mean, those are real numbers. You know, I always say this as an attorney. I, I like to deal in facts, not rumor or conjecture. The fact of the matter is this, those 8,000 plus deaths could have been prevented had we followed simple germ theory. That 30 mm -hmm. plus percent of all small business that will never open their doors again could have been prevented had we not picked winners and losers, meaning you can allow Home Depot and Lowe's to, to post record quarters. And if you, know, if you recall back in May of 2020, I stood outside of Coho Brewing, which is a female-owned brewery, which is conveniently situated right across the street from a Home Depot, where at the time, Governor Murphy had declared some businesses essential and others non-essential. Home Depot had over 200 cars in their parking lot directly across the street from a small woman-owned business. Who It's a wonderful brewery. And she was only allowed to do takeout. Now, you and I both know this. The only way small breweries, especially in the um, craft, excuse me, craft brew business, people go there and taste the beer and they decide what they want to take home. How are people going to go to a brewery and just do pick, take out beer only? It's not, I mean, it nearly killed businesses. And many of them, unfortunately, 30% shut their doors forever. I, I don't know how the state can apologize enough to those multi-generational small mom and pop stores, restaurants, businesses that will never open their doors again. Right. And Michael, do you think that your colleagues in the Senate and also in the assembly understand the, have they ever read article one rights and privileges of the people and their unalienable right to uh, uh, pursue, to obtain and safely protect their property, which not only is uh, applied to real estate but the money that they make and the businesses that they're owning and these this idea this right this fervor first right and privilege in the constitution article one doesn't even seem to be given a consideration by phil murphy and the democrats whatsoever well look jr you know i've said this before and and, and i don't and i don't say this as rhetoric i mean as as a true republican i believe that the constitution is supposed to provide equal rights, not special rights. It is supposed to be this lighthouse that guides us through the mm -hmm. through the 
through the troubled waters that, that is our government, that is our nation, that is our state. Unfortunately, instead of seeing it as that lighthouse, uh, they, the Democratic Party, the modern Democratic Party, really sees the Constitution as an obstacle to their mm, agenda. Very and, and that's really what, you know, the juxtaposition that we have, in my humble estimation, is that we see it as a lighthouse and we want to adhere to what our framers wanted and believed good government should be, you know, as from Tocqueville to Cicero to, <laughs> to George Washington to Ben Franklin, to, you know, all, all of the people that you and I talk about, to Lincoln, you know, the father of the Republican Party. No. Unfortunately, right. that other side sees the Constitution as an obstacle. Right. And that's unfortunate. You know, you hear them talk about it being a living, breathing document. That's not what it is. That's not what it is, folks. I mean, it's a document that's supposed to be adhered to. And look, that's why I, you know, always considered Justice Scalia sort of my muse. And I don't agree with him on everything. I mean, but, you know, I would say as far as justices go in our modern times, he's the justice that I agree with the most. Um, if it doesn't say it in there, we can't read it to be interpreted, in, you know, as what the framers intended. That's what the amendment process is for. Right. I mean, and thank God for some of the amendments. You know, I mean, we have evolved as a nation by creating amendments and, you know, mm -hmm. we should be following those as well. Right. And do you think, Michael, that uh, because the executive orders have the force of law and you as a legislator, the Constitution gives you the sole authority in making law. Do you think, number one, that <clears throat> we could get back to the legislative body restricting um, expansion of executive powers, number one? And then number two, do you think the legislature will be able to uh, articulate a definition of what constitutes an emergency, a public health emergency? Do you think those two possibilities exist? I think there's a possibility that people are waking up in the state of New Jersey and they're realizing that, hey, wait a minute. No one man should have this much power. And I think in other states that are similarly situated to New Jersey, people are waking up and saying, hey, wait a minute. No one person should have this much power vested in them. You know, the, the, the legislature, as you know, you know, you and I love to talk about the origins of our republic. The legislature right. is supposed to be that separate but equal branch. That is the check and balance on the executive and to create laws that one day may be interpreted by the judiciary, right? I mean, there's that th three separate but equal branches. And I think I sent you this article, and if I didn't, it was, again, I have to give a shout out to my law partner, Justin White. I always give credit where credit's due. He posted yeah. about this article about how the United States is becoming more and more like a monarchy because of how many yes. executive powers are vested in our president. And look at, and look at what's happening. Yes. And, and in reality, you know, Governor Murphy has more executive powers for New Jersey than the president does for the United States of America. I don't particularly like that. You know, I, I appreciate the executive's role uh, and I respect the executive's role in government, but I don't like when the executive's role steps into my role. You know, I think we all have to stay in our own lanes. And, you know, that's why we have 40 senators. That's why we have 80 assemblymen and women. We're supposed to be making the laws. And the fact that there was zero check and balance on Governor Murphy's mm -hmm. unfettered executive powers, I, I just can't fathom that the people of New Jersey would continue to want to live under a form of government that really resembles a monarchy and not a republic. Otherwise, why have the legislature, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we're supposed to be playing an integral role. And as I said in one of my speeches, you know, we don't have a seat at the table. We're not even playing the same sport and we're not in the same stadium. Right. I mean, you know, he's taken us effectively out of the game completely. And I can tell you, that's not why I got elected. That's not why I wanted to be elected to the legislature. Obviously I realized that, you know, when you have 40 people in the Senate, you're going to need to work with other people. That's why I, that's why I wanted to get into the Senate to work with other people, make good law, Maybe take away some of the yes. laws that are bad, actually, you know, that are on the books. Maybe cut regulations, help cut some taxes, 
that are, you know, squeezing and strangling New Jerseyans as they're trying to open businesses and actually save some of the property that they're that they've earned, meaning money, and actually mm-hmm. give them more authority of their own property in their land. You know, because we have some such a regulatory scheme, as I call it, the the alphabet soup of the New Jersey regulatory scheme. So that's why I went there. Well, Michael, let me, uh, I'd like to highlight a couple more of uh, your many, many accomplishments. Of course, here's another one, test of votes against bill eliminating religious exemption for vaccinations. And of course, this was early on, Michael, but uh, you really became a hero uh, amongst the uh, anti-vaxxers. And of course, the science is by no means settled uh, on these vaccinations. And uh, you've been uh, supporting the uh, rights of uh, human autonomy of each individual's right of uh, and ex- really accentuating the liberty that is involved with a person being able to decide for themselves, where we see the Democrats and Phil Murphy and the nationally with Joe Biden wanted Democrats wanting mandated vaccines. And immediately you came out in support of religious um, exemptions for these vaccinations. You know, you use the word liberty. Um, that's where I went with it on December 12th of 2019. I remember where I was. I was a substitute in the health committee. And the way I see it, you know, again, I'm, I'm using my legal background, JR, for, you know, everything. I look through that lens when I look at legislation. And, you know, I learned in law school that, and, and many people probably will disagree with this, there's a certain sect of Christianity that it's been held up by our United States Supreme Court as constitutional that can deny their child a life-saving blood transfusion. That's been deemed constitutional by our United States Supreme Court. And in the state of New Jersey, you have to, if someone, God forbid, is inebriated, whether it be by liquor or a drug, and they kill someone with a motor vehicle, the police have to get a warrant in order to pierce someone's skin to draw that blood to determine whether they were in fact intoxicated by alcohol or by some other uh, controlled dangerous substance at the time that they were operating the motor vehicle. I have a real Mm -hmm. problem giving that much power to the government that they can determine what a parent is required to accept and give their child. And it's against the will of many of the parents. I just have a real problem with that. Um, You know, I am not, I want to be clear. I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I am a 100% pro-liberty person. The beautiful thing Mm -hmm. about the United States of America and our Republic is that you're free to make decisions. And some of those decisions, guess what? Many people may disagree with, but you're still free to make those decisions. And unfortunately, you know, you and I have discussed this, the modern Democratic Party wants to control your life from womb to tomb. Mm. And, you know, the Republican Party actually is the much larger tent uh, party, is the party of inclusion, and it actually believes in what we know and is most sacred to our republic as individual rights. And, mm-hmm. you know, what, you know, that's something that's lost in this groupthink mentality coming out of the Biden administration, the Murphy administration. You know, they, they want an absolute groupthink mentality. And, I, and, I, and, you know, I'm going to be a little bit geeky here. You know, if you watch the Star Trek Next Generation, we remember the Borg, you know, the Borg will assimilate you. And, and that's mm-hmm. their mentality. I, I, you know, I liken the modern Democratic Party to the Borg. They are a party of pure assimilation. They are a monolith. They don't like any individual expressions. They actually, you know, and think about it. They're turning against themselves at this point. Even people like Bill Maher. I watch him regularly now because he's now all of a sudden turning against this radical groupthink mentality that is being employed and shoved down the throats of citizenry by democratic regimes across the United States of America. Yeah, no question. Michael, I also want to uh, highlight another um, significant um, accomplishment on your part. And that was, uh, people are still able to see this. And this uh, was a discussion that you had um, with the chair lady, 
Judy Persia Shelley, the New Jersey Department of Health. And I thought your questions were very, very um, poignant. And uh, it was amazing from the very beginning, you asking why she didn't speak before a bipartisan um, committee. And of course, the Democrats were asked to participate. And of course, they all um, declined uh, because they believe that because they are in power, that they don't need to work with Republicans. And um, you had mentioned or you had asked her why she didn't. Uh, and she really never gave you an answer, Michael, except that she was too busy. Is that a fair assertion? If I recall, Jr., she said that she's been working till 11 o'clock at night every night. Um, you know, <laughs> COVID made many of us, particularly those in the legislature that wanted to be very involved and I know most of my colleagues on my side of the aisle were because we were talking to each other regularly. We were all doing the same thing. And I, and I, I just don't think it has been was fair of someone who was supposed to be the commissioner, the head of a Department of Health to deny a bipartisan inquiry into her activities. You know, I remember in March of 2020, so. If I, if I recall correctly, that questioning took place in May of 2020. Mm, yep. And May 20. I'm sorry, 2021. In, in March of 2020, Judith Perzicelli had said that every single New Jerseyan was eventually going to be infected by COVID. But that changed. The, the whole conversation changed. If, you know, let, let's go back to the beginning. You know, I, and JR, you know, I've told you this many times. One of my favorite professors at Villanova undergrad used to say, the best place to start is the beginning. We went from 15 days to flatten the curve. That was the beginning. Then it went to, hey, just a little bit longer. And then it became, you know, what I call the pall of the executive orders that we were going to be living under. And again, this is why I have such faith in the New Jersey citizenry. I think that if they go back and really take a hard look and the media actually starts to be honest and covers this the way they should be covering it, they're going to realize that New Jerseyans have been duped. There are other states where we did not employ this heavy, iron-fisted mentality of the executive order that, guess what? Mm -hmm. They didn't have the death rate that the state of New Jersey did, and that did not shut down 30% of all of their small businesses forever. You know, unfortunately, like you said, when you have someone who's in power the way the Democratic Party is, look, they have the executive, they have the legislature, both houses. Mm -hmm. You get there's of a course, certain Michael. Of, go ahead. No, go ahead. Now, there's a certain arrogance that comes with that when you have that unfettered power, and you know and the you governor. You can see that in this discussion. One hundred percent, and you know, and the governor keeps you know patting her on the back and telling her what a great job she's doing and how she needs no introduction. You know, it, it's 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 disturbing what happened there. It really is disturbing what happened there, um, and she just didn't think that she needed to come before a panel and answer our questions, which were honest. And guess what? The questions weren't going to be asked for me and Senator Panaccio and Senator Oraho and Senator O'Scanlan and the rest of the Republican senators that participated. It was for the, the citizenry of the state of New Jersey. That's who needs and deserves those answers as to why these decisions have been made. Um, you know, look, COVID's going to be around from, as far as I can tell. It's going to be around and we're going to have to find a way and that we should have been trying to find a way from very early on to live with this virus. And again, if people want to stay home and they want to work remotely, guess what? That's their right. But it's also, as we as what I said early on, with the 30 percent of all of our small businesses closing their doors forever, there is this thing called the Constitution. And guess what? With some of the restrictions that were placed on those businesses that eventually were forced to close, doesn't that constitute a taking pursuant to our constitution? I think it does. Yes. I agree. I think it does. A governmental taking. Who's emergency? Point, Michael. You know, when you have Home Depot, Lowe's, Sam's Club, BJ's, Costco posting record quarters, and the person that is the third or fourth generation family member has to shut their business down. Is that fair? Is that truly stronger and fairer? I don't think so. Right. A couple of points, Mike, I want to make is, is that uh, the commissioner was appointed by Phil Murphy. So she's already a partisan in that respect. 
And then she made the, she had the audacity to Michael say that the, the management of the COVID-19 emergency um, is directed by the Department of Health. Uh, I would think, and of course, this is an administrative agency um, created uh, actually long ago, it was actually prior to just after the Civil War, but of course, it became a true bureaucracy and administrative agency after the 1947 New Jersey Constitution. But uh, the point being is, is that she, and I've argued this, Michael, I've suggested that she in 2020, and maybe even continuing on today, is the second most powerful person in the state politically, and by, ne by no means uh, any offense towards the state uh, or the Senate president. But this woman has had more uh, ability to affect the livelihood, affecting the lockdown implementation, saying that the Board of Health should be managing and is managing the COVID-19, where we believe the Constitution gives the legislature the ability, as well as the executive, in managing not just the board, the health board, but also the legislature as well. So, Jr., I would have no problem with the Department of Health and specifically Commissioner Herzicelli if we actually were part of the conversation, if these decisions were made. Right in tandem, where if we were meeting together with, and hey, look, not, even not me, I mean, I'm, I'm a, you know, a freshman legislator, but what about just leaders from both parties? You know, you could have the assembly leader, you know, John Bramnick at the time, Senate leader, minority leader, Tom Kane, obviously the Senate president and Speaker Coughlin, just meet with them. Meet with them so they can give us the information that went down at the meeting. And then as a legislature, we could actually make some decisions. But we were excluded from the game. We were excluded from the process for the better part of you know, 19 months. It's, is, that, is that appropriate? To my, my answer to that is absolutely not. You, know, you can't just take away an essential part of government. You want to talk about essential? What about the legislature? The legislature is supposed to be essential, a separate but equal branch. And, you know, look, that's yes. why, you know, there were there were some of us who were extremely outspoken and, they, and and I'll give shouts out to them. I mean, you know, everybody had statements to make. But, you know, the, the Senator Doherty, Senator Panaccio, Senator Oroho, myself, Senator O'Scanlan, Assemblyman Bergen, uh, obviously Antoine and Eric, Assemblyman Simonson and Assemblyman McClellan right. were were all over it because we are a team. You know, we, we are not happy with this. And, and look, especially in Legislative District 1, where you have so many businesses that rely on a specific season. 2021 was different, but 2020, our businesses barely survived 2020 in those seasonal businesses. And if it weren't for the shoulder season, which is if, for people that don't know, it's, you know, the month or two before the summer and the month or two after summer, those businesses wouldn't be able to survive. But thank God, Cape May County has done such a great job at advertising uh, the, the fact that tourism doesn't just end on Labor Day, right, or after Labor Day weekend, right. that those businesses were able to survive and continue. But, you know, I, I liken it to this, JR. You know, you know, I like to go out to eat quite a bit. You know, some restaurants were able to innovate. And, you know, the great thing that we learned about COVID-19 is that our businesses and our, and our captains of industry, they're innovative. So many people were able to use their parking lots as a dining space. But guess what? Right. What about the small restaurants that didn't have a parking lot? They're done. Yeah. It's over. That's right. So quite literally, Governor Murphy took away their business. You know, and, and think about it. We're going to talk about following the science, right? That's what, you know, as Republicans, we always get accused of not following the science, which is ridiculous because obviously – it was called the novel coronavirus early on because it was new and we didn't know a whole lot about it. And that's why I think people right. were comfortable with 15 days of flattening the curve and then extending it, as I said, uh, and, and I'm giving them their best their best argument. OK, let's go 60 days, mm -hmm. not 19 months. Right. Like, you know, let, let's go 60 days. But that only brought us to pre. You know, um, pre Memorial Day. Last year of 2020. Right. You know, mm -hmm. so of course, Michael, Michael, what you're uh, talking about, too, as far as the uh, incorporating the legislative branch, I mean, what you're describing is exactly what the Constitution, our Constitution says in Article three, the distribution of the powers of government, powers of government should be divided among three distinct branches, legislative, executive and judicial. 
no person or persons belonging to or constituting one branch shall exercise any of the powers properly belonging to either of the others, except as expressly provided in this constitution. So what you're saying is indicative of exactly what the constitution prescribes in the, in the working together of the administrative branches. And before we move on from Commissioner Perchicelli, I want to uh, also say that I thought it was very uh, poignant in you asking her uh, why the broad brush application throughout the entire state? Cumberland County had much different uh, figures and statistics as well as Cape May, very different than Hudson County or Essex County or the Northern counties, Monmouth County and so forth. And she just basically said, well, that's, that's the way we made that decision arbitrarily. And you being a big, uh, both of us being big um, um, advocates or students of the Austrian school and F.A. Hayek. And F.A. Hayek talked about the, um, um, the importance of the use of knowledge in society. And you mentioned the fact, why weren't private industries involved with the testing? We saw that it was all, all CDC based. We saw that it was that the government had complete central power on what was going on, where they could have opened up to private enterprises. You could open up the local government to make better decisions. You, Antoine, and Eric are, of course, much more um, familiar with the um, distinctions and the, and the differences between our counties as opposed to other counties. And none of that was taken into consideration by the uh, commissioner or Phil Murphy in bringing about these all-encompassing lockdown rules, Michael, that had a dramatic economic and psychological effect on the people. Well, 100 percent. I mean, you, you, you've said a mouthful there, Jr. But, you know, as far as the regionalization of the decisions that should have been made, we must remember that Legislative District 1 had less than 2 percent of all COVID-19 cases in the state at the height of COVID-19, at the height you know, in the, in the earlier stages of 2020. So, that, you know, I'm, I'm talking July of 2020. We still accounted for less than 2% of all cases. Yet we had the same, the same lockdowns as where the worst outbreaks were. And look, you know, it, it made absolutely no sense at the time. It still doesn't make sense to this day. Again, what are you going to get out of the Murphy administration? An apology because your third generation business had to shut its doors forever? Good luck. I mean, you know, what good is that going to do when they did everything they could to keep their business open. Um, and, you know, you talked about the psychological effects. Let, let's be honest mm -hmm. here. You know, many of our children are going to be suffering the most psychological effects of COVID-19. Uh, you know, there's a loss of education for sure. You know, I, I you know, and, I, and look, my wife is a public school teacher. She's an educator. They People have worked very hard, but the problem was, Many children weren't attending classes the way they're supposed to class remotely. Uh, we're supposed to be attending remotely. It's, it's, there are many children that are going to be left behind. And also, many of our special needs students who need personal interaction were really far left behind during the COVID-19 era. And, and that's something that, you know, I, I don't hear being talked about regularly. And it's, and it's unfortunate. Let me share one more uh, screen, uh, Michael, and I want to uh, highlight uh, uh, your website um, on the um, testa.senatenj.com. I invite all the people to go here. Uh, here's some more great information. Michael has, um, and the whole Testa team um, has great information up here. Everybody, uh, I encourage you to go and look at this page. Recently, Michael, you you put out business industry labor groups say Murphy's energy master plan, a disaster plan. Of course, we could get into that. Uh, we don't have uh, a whole lot of time, but more irresponsible spending that, that you and the uh, and your team are uh, advocating for, for uh, taxpayer justice. And I think it's very uh, in indicative of how quickly you understood what was happening in Trenton by talking about all the different monikers or um, everything that is put before the word justice, all the different descriptions. And you made point that, well, how about taxpayer justice? We've got criminal justice, social justice, environmental justice, and yet we never have taxpayer justice. I thought that was very appropriate. Well, well, thank you, JR. I mean, you know, that was something that, again, you know, through my training as an attorney, I want to use people's words against them, obviously. 
but this is very this is very real. Um, this is this is a problem because you know nobody ever seems to think about the taxpayer in the state of New Jersey. We are a, a, on an unsustainable path. We are, we have the greatest outward migration of our citizenry. We're suffering from a severe brain drain. I mean, one thing one thing that New Jersey gets really right is education. We're number one. We're ranked number one for a reason. Now, granted, we spend a fortune, but we are number one and we're number one for a reason. And we have some phenomenal universities right here in our own backyard in the state of New Jersey. We have Rutgers, we have Rowan, we have Stockton. I mean, so, and those are just, and that's not even including our community colleges that we have, which are all excellent, but we're suffering from a severe brain drain because these youngsters are getting a phenomenal education in the state of New Jersey. And they realize that I don't want to live in my parents' basement because I can't afford anything in the state of New Jersey. So they they move to a state that maybe they're not making the same amount of money salary wise their first couple of years. And maybe in, in many instances, they actually are. But the cost of living is so much lower. I mean, that's the problem with the state of New Jersey. It's literally squeezing the life out of its citizenry by by their just onerous tax system that we have here. I mean, I think the average property tax is over $9,000 at this point per, per household. That's, you know, that's not a sustainable path. And, and, and think about it. So many of our citizens who are our seniors and our veterans who are saying, I don't have children in the school system. I know where most of my taxes go. I'm tired of paying this. Or simply, I can't afford to pay this. I need to go elsewhere. Right. And Michael, as we wrap the show up, I want to say that, you know, often attorneys get a bad reputation, but you and learning from your father and your grandfather and all those that are part of your firm, you know, there are very good attorneys out there. You are indicative of that. And this is important for a representative to have the knowledge that you have acquired with law. And you represent everything that the Constitution Republicans advocate, which is for an intellectual rigor of, to the representative, which you clearly have, and then the understanding and the knowledge of the Constitution as the other important um, priority or the other important prerequisite in being a proper representative, and you personify both. I can't thank you enough for that, JR. Look, you and I, you know, long before you even had the New Jersey Constitutional Republicans, you and I spoke about our mutual love for the Constitution of the United States of America, how it's a married document to the Declaration of Independence that so many people fail. They, they read them in a vacuum. You can't read them in a vacuum at all. I mean, you know, they're, they're married documents. And that's the blueprint for our government. It's, it's when we go astray from that blueprint that we get some of the abominations that we have that have come through the legislature and come through our United States government, whether it's New Jersey government, the United States government. And, you know, one of the things that, that really disturbs me is all of these regulatory bodies, you know, um, there, thank God there's actually, you know, a red tape commission that's been, that was formed by a senator on the other side of the aisle. I mean, think about that. You know, a, a member of the Democratic Party is heavily criticized because of it. He formed a red tape commission in the state of New Jersey because they're, you know, businesses just can't start here. And if they are here, they need a general counsel, an attorney just to figure out all of the regulations that they need to comply with. That's not fair. You know, unfortunately, New Jersey has lost trust of its citizenry and the businesses that are here. There needs to be a level of trust between the government and the citizenry and businesses that they're not going to be bad actors. And look, if there are bad actors out there, and, and, and I'm not saying they don't exist, they should be punished appropriately. But right. the fact of the matter is you can't squeeze the business community so hard, just like Governor Murphy's doing with this additional $250 million in taxes to fund the UI fund, who, by the way, wasn't working this entire time. I mean, I, I, and I can even hear it in my inflection that I, I'm getting angry about it because my office was fielding all of those calls because the Department of Labor wasn't working to help with these unemployment claims. I mean, to think that right now was the right time to impose an additional $250 million in taxes on businesses when all of this federal money is sitting there and can be used for it, it's, it's, it's preposterous. And Governor Murphy even said, well, I talked to Michael and he brought up some valid points. Well, if there's such valid points, why don't you follow them? Why don't you just pump the brakes on this? But, you know, it, it, it sounds like a good talking point for Governor Murphy, but doesn't work for the citizenry, I guess. 
And Michael, we have an election on November the 2nd. It's imperative that all Republicans, independents, and Michael, there still may be some rational thinking Democrats out there. They need to vote. If you've got your vote by mail, vote now, send it in, vote on November the 2nd. I'm going to be going to my local voting um, location. But I implore all Republicans to make sure we get 100% participation in reelecting our state senator, Michael Testa, and the Team Testa team of Samuel McClellan and Simonson. Uh, what wonderful representation, probably the most important in the entire state and, and leading this Republican res, uh, uh, resurgence, which the, occurred with the initial victory, we must Make sure these men are reelected. And I implore everyone, share the video, get the message out, let people know about Senator Testa. If they don't, we have great, great leadership, uh, indicative of how the Republican Party is becoming the party of tomorrow. And it's men like Michael and our assembly candidates to do it. But I implore all Republicans, vote, get the vote in now and vote on November 2nd. Vote Republican. And also, Michael, our governor. We want to vote for Jack Cettarelli to make the necessary change and end the monarchy that's occurred in Trenton. But now D1, Republicans vote in force and vote in mass. And, and, and Jr., you're absolutely right. We need to vote Republican from the top of the ticket to the bottom of the ticket. And I know there are rational Democrats out there. I know there are. Look, there are some very <laughs> radical ones who identify as Democrats. And, and, and guess what? Most of those people who are radical aren't even Democrats. They're they're leftist socialists, right? I mean, there are Linskyites that are calling themselves Democrats. They're not real Democrats, but there are plenty of rational thinking Democrats. And, and look, that's how Governor Christie got elected to two terms. And I think we're going to see a big surprise um, come November 2nd. I think a lot of people are going to be voting for Jack Cittarelli because guess what? The business community, the citizenry, they're waking up and they're saying we cannot sustain being governed by someone who thinks he's a king. Um, you know, who rules simply by executive power. And I think that you're going to see the Republican resurgence continue. I do believe that. Um, and, you know, certainly I want to thank you for hosting myself and Antoine McClellan. I know he was on the session right before me. Uh, the guy is just mm -hmm. phenomenal. He's he's like a brother. So yeah. is Eric to me. Um, you know, we're, yeah. I, I always say we're like the three legged stool. We don't function without one of those legs. So it's, it's all of us yeah. uh, together. Team. And um I can't thank you enough, Jr., for hosting us and, and keeping the New Jersey constitutional Republicans uh, in the vein of educating people and firing people up to get out to vote. Because so many people out there believe that their vote doesn't count. It counts. Believe me. Oh, get out to vote. Does. And if you have a vote by mail ballot, fill it out properly and get it to the proper place, whether you're bringing it actually to the Board of Elections yourself or to one of the drop boxes or putting it in the mail. The vote, your vote counts. Trust me, and it makes a difference. So. Thank you so much, right. Jr. I greatly appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Michael. And all Republicans in Cumberland County, LD1, K May County, make sure you're voting Republican. We should have 100% turnout for this election. But Michael, thank you so much. I congratulate you on a couple of great years. And uh, I congratulate you um, um, maybe a little bit early, but I think we're going to be congratulating you on six more years. And uh, well, that's all. two more. It's only two more, brother. Two more years. That's all I get. So right this time, two, two more. more. Well, it's, it's a six, but it's a six year term, correct? No, two year term. Oh, you got to run again in two years. All right. Well, we'll be ready for yeah. that. We'll be ready for that election as well. Michael, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining me. And remember what uh, Lincoln said, liberty to all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.